Okay, so I'm going to do um, another paid one critique, and I will talk about why in a second. Um, first off, I will say that um, if I'm even lower energy than normal, it's because I'm not feeling very well. And if you want to cheer me up, you should uh, buy more copies of my books. Uh, feels like COVID, but the test says no. We will see. Um, just a couple of points of news, and then I'll move into the critique. The first is to say that we are halfway through the SPFBO, so we will be handing out um, 10 of these guys in the next two and a half months. And you should keep your eye on that. Lots of good books um, coming through the process and sadly, many good books be being cut. So that's just the, the nature of the beast. And the other thing is that I was um, sent the um, Grim Oak Press 10th anniversary edition of King of Thorns, which is a lovely book. It's got a um, new cover by Jason Chan, signed by me and Jason Chan, and it's numbered, and it's leather-bound, and it has illustrations along with a handy ribbon to mark your page. Um, so all in all, a very nice um, high-end thing with a fairly high-end price, has to be said. Um, all of the, uh, the Prince of Thorns 10th anniversary edition from Grimoke sold out. Um, but if you want, I'm sure they will match your number if you have one of those. Um, and if you're desperate, I'm sure if you scour eBay, you will find um, one at a ridiculous price somewhere. Anyway, that's it. So... I said about six months ago that I was not doing um, the page one critiques anymore, that I'd sort of run out of um, road on them. And maybe that's true to some extent, but uh, I enjoyed doing them. I started to miss um, doing them. And uh, so I asked um, on just my Facebook little post if anyone wanted to send new page ones in because I felt it was in a good idea to, to use more up-to-date ones so that uh, if the author... Uh, had any interest and agreed with any of the points I made, then they would have the opportunity to um, to make changes. Um, I did start with critiquing um, a new um, uh, page one of a, of a book that was recently released, and I felt I didn't release that. I felt that probably it just had too much. Um, if somebody wanted to read it the wrong way, where they were willfully like antagonistic, then they could uh portray it as as in a negative light um so i thought i'll only do page ones um from um lesser known authors where that page one is is unpublished and they definitely have the opportunity to to make any changes they they feel necessary and they may well just look at what i've i've said and say no, that's all rubbish I'm not make any changes and that's entirely fine and uh, uh writers should have the, the courage to do that as well as the open of mind to um, make adjustments if those adjustments speak to them. So um, here's my standard disclaimer, which you can read, which just says my opinions aren't worth anything. Um, or and also say that uh, if uh, that I, I actually do this sort of critique on, on whole batches of of chapters on a monthly basis for the uh, the top tier of my um, Patreon. So if you are interested in regular feedback, um, have, have a look at that. So this is uh, a page one from an author called Rebecca Stiles, um, who sent it to me a couple of weeks ago. And it's a page one for an upcoming book called Chain of Bones. So what I do is I read the page one out without any comments whatsoever. I apologise in advance because I'm not a very good reader. And then I go through it with my thoughts. So let's just start. Like a malicious donkey, the door heed open and hoard closed with every crest and dip of the par. Baradin wiped her face on a nearby shirt and sighed at the useless wedge of paper she'd shoved under the door, watching as it slid back and forth in the dip of the wooden boards. She hated fixing things. It never went right. Vi scanned the shelves of rolled and folded maps, some hand drawn by herself across two decades, others by hands equally as calloused generations before her time aboard. 
A stack of reports from surveyors and logbooks of journeys mixed with ledgers and tallies were pushed far to the back of the shelves, whilst newer documents and trinkets and knives from faraway places sat in easy sight and reach. There was a thick leather folder containing letters of proposed contracts, sponsorships for further expeditions from whence the current wedge of paper had been taken, but none of it was recent, probably because it had been five very long years since setting foot in the dirt of civilization. She doubted any of those factors would even recall the proposals they had sent. She yawned against the heat and lack of sleep. Nothing seemed a suitable wedge, not even the actual wedge. Again, she had to wipe her sweating forehead, then dipped a pen into the ink bottle and hovered over the chart she'd been working on. If she sold all the new maps, there would be enough money to return home, be with her children. But the cabin and the pa was her home too. Its smell of pages and leather mingled with sea, decking oils, wax for the sails, and she crinkled her nose. A lot of unwashed men. The three children she had conceived in, in the bed she no longer shared. Children she had promised to return to, believing that she would only be away a year. Her sadness ground to a halt, and anger began to flood through her as the door laughed again. It laughed because no one had fixed it properly. No one had fixed it because it needed new parts, and there was no money for, for new things, because Captain Rayash had spent all their coin upgrading the par. This apparently did not include doors and hinges, nor a million other things on board the ship. Her ship. Her ship and her money. Not that anyone else cared much about either point. She'd sell the maps and figure things out from there. Bai took a steadying breath and set pen to paper only to find the ink had dried in the immense heat. She stabbed the pen into its crib and reached for the string-wrapped graphite stick to continue marking their progress, forcing herself to stay focused. Mid-knuckle joint. Vi scowled at the random interruption, tried to ignore the conversation seeping down to her cabin, just as she tried to ignore the wretched door. Dragging the shirt down her face to her now dripping neck and chest, and flinging it aside, she moved to the other end of the large map table and lifted the jug, empty, and stumped it back down. What she wouldn't give for some ice-cold fruit juice instead of warm water, which seemed to just go straight through her. She hoped that their next port had supplies enough for them. Somehow, and with a shudder, she doubted it. Staring down at the chart, Vi dragged her finger across the, their route until it crossed a line and the listed fathom count dropped suddenly. That would be tomorrow. They had run too far already. So that's the, the thing read cold. And uh, let's talk about my thoughts. So the first line, um, we get this heeing and whoring, and heeing and whoring almost do the job. Like if it if it meowed, we wouldn't need to say like a cat. Donkeys are less familiar, so there's a maybe a need to put in something about a donkey. And if you just put in like a donkey, the door heed and hoard, that just feels a little bare. So I can see why she's put like a malicious donkey. She felt the need to sort of dress it up. Um, but is malicious the real, really the right word there? It doesn't doesn't really. I don't understand in that instance why malicious is a, a suitable word. Um, so I would either lean into it uh, and add words and say like consistently annoying donkey or some such, just make it a bit more amusing, um, or just lose the donkey entirely and rely on the reader to understand that heeing and hawing is is the the noise donkeys make. Um, and this next bit is is kind of my stupidity, but other readers may may share it, a minority. Um, I read this thing the first time, and I was under the impression for several more lines um, that we were on a carriage, you know, um, horse-drawn carriage, and the type of carriage was a par, and that's, you know, the door of the carriage, it was banging. Um, and it turns out it's not, we're on a ship. Um, and that may be obvious, but uh, I feel there are ways to signal that it's a ship almost immediately just by using the word wave or sail or something at some point. Um, I've crossed out wooden there because um, you tend to have to use an adjective when it's going to tell you something that you don't know. And if you're on a ship and it's boards, they're going to be wooden. So tell me if they're made of cheese, but don't tell me if they're wooden. Um, and then we have this uh, quite long description here of all the, the bits and pieces that are in this office of hers. Um, and it's a good description. This, this whole thing is well written. Um, but 
we've also spent like 10 lines there describing things that are in the room. Um, and this is a good description if you found it on page 100 or something. But on page one, I'm thinking, should we really be using up all this valuable real estate um, just to describe, you know, uh, a desk in a, a chart maker's cabin? I think you can rely on the reader in some sense. If you said what she was doing there, the reader would probably fill in a lot of the, the detail. Um, you know, it's, if I tell you the map maker's uh, cabin on a, on a ship and I just put in one or two things, you know, the rolled maps or the, uh, the, the, the um, I don't know, sextant or whatever, then you will probably conjure most of that and, and you won't need this, this long description, especially on, on page one. But um, it's not a major crime or anything. Um, and then we get the, the sort of first um, element of, in quotes, interest, because up to now we've just been, you know, she's on a ship. Um, we get this, she hasn't been back for five years. Um, and that sets up a, the beginning of an interesting situation with there's possible tension and there's questions. Uh, questions, why has she been away so long? And the tension is, what's going to have changed uh, when she comes back. There's a lot of talk of this door and this wedge here, and it does say that she's she's not good at fixing things, but she's also a map maker, which is a sort of precise scientific discipline. And wedging a door is so simple that I have just trouble buying into the idea that, that she can't. Um, and it's not a big deal, you know, but we... The business of writing a book is, is of creating this illusion. And if I'm thinking this isn't right on page one, then you have a lot more difficulty creating that illusion for me. And, you know, wedging a door, I've wedged doors with paper many times. It's easy. It works well. Um, and this disbelief, I feel, damages the story. Um, and here she is. She's wiping the sweat and she's talking about the smells the smells are great to uh, establish you know the feeling and the the ambience of the place it's crinkling her nose at lots of unwashed men i think after five years she probably wouldn't smell that but um but anyway we now have a very definite ship setting and it's been nicely done and uh, i just say that it could have been made a bit more idiot proof in the first few lines just to prevent me going on down the carriage route because you can never tell as a writer what your readers are going to do that they are it's like herding cats and my mind went off in a direction that maybe she hadn't anticipated um and here we hear about the, the three children and um her promising to come back in a year so the tension and the questions are strengthened um you know, now we've got children who will have aged five years that's a big deal for a child um why did she stay away so long are the kids even alive are they in the place she left them what she could have returned to so that's that's nice and there's some stuff about how she feels. Um, and uh, she's complaining about this Captain Raya spending the money on the ship. Uh, and we talk about this door again. This door is a big deal in this, this first page. Um, and it's saying that she's is implying she's got absolutely no control over the spending of her own money. So that seems pretty odd. I mean, it makes me think is she some sort of prisoner. Is she being exploited? Is she been hijacked in some sense? Um, and the author actually sent the first two pages, so I, I read the second one. And it turns out this isn't the case, and she's ordering the crew around in the next page. So this just seems a bit odd that um, she's ordering the crew around quite sort of briskly, and yet this man's spending her money without her say so. But I guess it's a question, what's going on? Um, and again, it, you know, we're talking about this door it just seemed like a non-problem. I mean, I'm thinking that most sailors are sort of handy men um, or handy people. Um, you know, they're good at improvising stuff with a knife and some rope and some tar and a bit of sailcloth. This door, um, it's overplayed. I'm not uh, not feeling it. Um, and then we talk about her sort of um, doing a bit more of her job. And then we get this random line. So it's the first spoken words. It's nice to have dialogue on, on page one. Um, this isn't dialogue, this is just a, an interjection. It's intriguing, but it's also confusing, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, we get some more description about how hot she is and if she likes some water and some nice cold fruit juice. Um, I just highlighted there because we've got down in proximity to itself. And if you, you repeating words is um, 
something everybody does and it's nice to down because it can um trigger a reader um and we also have this dragging and drag uh this stuff is is good scene setting in terms of of um you know how she's feeling hot and uncomfortable although you know, she has been at sea for five years so she you think again might be used to this sort of stuff um but again I'm, I'm asking should we really be spending this much room on page one telling me how hot and sweaty she is we've already mentioned it up the page and i feel there are more important more hooky things that we could be um using to, to ensure that every reader turns the page um and final lines she's uh tracing their path across the the map and there's some sort of trench coming up but it's not particularly intimidating if you're in a boat okay the sea is deeper there um so is this supposed to be ominous maybe it is maybe it isn't uh but it's for me it's not a you must turn the page to find out line um at the end of page one i can recognize that the writing is good this is well written and um that's not the case in a lot of um stuff i see um so you know big marks for that but it's actually the quality of the writing that is really the the thing here that will make me turn the page i don't feel that there are enough strong hooks um to force me into it other than having faith in the writer because she's done a good job on a line by line basis um so i think page one's done a good good job on setting the setting um and we do have this question which is the, the long delayed return and the, the waiting children um i feel that if a reader is predisposed to be interested in this kind of thing they'll probably turn the page but for your your sort of wider reading public um i feel you're maybe not selling it hard enough to force them to turn the page even if they're not particularly interested in map making or sea voyages or mothers and children because uh you could be more intriguing force them further into the book and by that time you'll have won them over and change their mind about whether they like these things anyway um and i did read the the second page and and the mc goes out of her cabin and tells off some crewmen for gambling over cutting off fingers um and then it ends with uh what's that behind you move which is it's fine because most people are going to turn to find out what that is behind them, but you have to back that up with something good, otherwise the reader's going to lose faith in you. And the only other thing I, I wanted to say was um, there was a bit in the description. Yeah, so this is good description. Um, as I said, I feel there's a lot of it, maybe too much, um, but she is bringing the character into the description. So she's not just telling you about the mats and the the books and the tools she's also saying that that she drew and she's talking about equally calloused hands so she's making you know that this character has calloused hands and she is making that description reflect both on the setting but on the character in the setting and that's that's well done anyway that's all i have to say about uh this and i will sign off catch you next time i've got a, a bunch more of these i'm not um canvassing for more to be sent to me because i've probably got more than i i need already let me find the uh the button that ends this